Thank you, gentlemen. If you'll stand with me, and let's take our Bibles and go to the second book of the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter number 33. And with the time that we have left to, tonight, and again, the service is a little bit longer than our normal service would be, and uh, certainly a, um, a night like this, we don't make any apology for that. And if folks uh, do need to step out for one reason or another, uh, yeah, certainly feel free to do so. Uh, but uh, I believe God's given us a message uh, that, again, conveys uh, the theme. And, uh, and so I want to preach that to you tonight. And so if you found your place there in the 33rd chapter of the book of Exodus, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1 and uh, read down through verse number 4. And then we're going to move a little bit further into the chapter and read uh, a little bit more of this chapter as we, uh, as we go along. The Bible says in verse number 1, The Lord said unto Moses, Depart. And go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. If you'll move with me to verse number 12, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray thee, If I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he, speaking of God, said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Verse 15, And Moses said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we've already enjoyed and experienced tonight. We pray, Lord, as we come now into this portion in which we open the Word of God and we consider what you have for us, give us, Lord, liberty to preach this passage. Lord, you've laid this thought and this theme and this burden on our heart. I pray, Lord, that you would enable me to be able to share this with our church congregation so they can understand the concept of following forward. And may it truly be our heartbeat that we go forward in 2019, but only as you lead us. May we follow you in every facet and aspect of our ministry and in our daily lives, in our homes and in our families, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we come to the 33rd chapter of the book of Exodus, we find that the children of Israel are in the first year after exiting Egypt. They had seen some of the mightiest acts from the hand of God that the world would ever see. In the previous chapter, Moses had been up on Mount Sinai when the people began to wonder if he would ever come down. In their impatience, they coerced Aaron into making them a golden calf to worship. We learn of that in verses 1 through 6 of Exodus chapter number 32. Moses was told by God what the people had done, and God determined to destroy them. This is the conversation Moses and God are having on Mount Sinai. Moses, the great interceder, pleads with God to spare the people, and God agrees to this request. We learn of this in verses 11 to 14. Moses makes his way down from Mount Sinai, and he confronts the people. And and, and in this confrontation, Uh, we find that the Levites uh, join with Moses on the Lord's side and they slay 3,000 of the strongest and most vocal rebels, according to verses 15 to 28. But there would be a price for the sin of idolatry. Because of the sin of God's people, God begins to distance himself from them. God begins to systematically pull back his presence from his people We learn of this, the first sign that we learn of this is in verse number 34 of Exodus 32. I want your eyes to see it. Again, the Lord is speaking to Moses and he says, Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angels shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. We find this introduction of this angel, God says, 
And God says, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send mine angel instead. Reminder that sin always equals the removal of God's presence from our lives. Whether it be sin within the church, whether it be sin in our home, whether it be sin in our marriage, whether it be sin uh, in, in, in some other context, you mark it down that when we tolerate sin, when we allow sin into our lives, it is always going to end up in the removal of God's presence. For our God is a holy God. And when the people invited idolatry into their community, when they crafted this golden calf and they began to worship it, God said, fine, if that's what you want, you can have that. But you can't have me and that at the same time. You must make a choice. You must make a decision. Moses is told in the 32nd chapter of Exodus, in the 34th verse, he is told to lead God's people forward. But implicit in this command is that he must do so without the full presence of God leading him. Some might jump at the opportunity. You mean I get to lead this great people and, 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 and you're going to send an angel and, and, and we won't have you, but at least we're going to get that which we've heard about and that which we've dreamed about all of these years. We still get the promised land. Some might, as opportunists, might jump at the chance. But Moses had a different heart. For Moses rightly recognizes that leading God's people apart from God's presence and God's power is a recipe for disaster. And at the outset of this year of transition, I feel led to make a bold declaration to our church family. I believe, listen, I believe that God has called me and has prepared me and even has equipped me to lead this church forward. I would not be here otherwise. If I didn't believe that this is what God's purpose was for my life and for my family, if I didn't believe that this is what God wanted, I would not be here. But I want you also to know something. I have no desire, I have no desire to lead this church into the future if God does not go forward to lead us. I wish to convey to you tonight that I believe God wants us to go forward as a church. But I also wish to convey to you tonight that I believe that, that, that God has called me to lead, but ultimately I want to convey to you tonight that I am not leading you anywhere. I am simply called to follow him. In fact, the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 1, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul urged the church at Corinth to follow him, but only so long as he was following Christ. The moment that Paul stepped outside of following Christ was the moment the Corinthian saints were free from the obligation, free from the responsibility to follow him. And I would like for us to walk through the 33rd chapter of Exodus together tonight as we consider this theme for this year of following forward. Yes, we want to go forward, but we don't want to go forward if the presence of God is not going to lead us there. That's the theme, that's the idea that I believe that God has led us to. Number one, I want you to consider from this passage of Scripture, we find the prompting to go forward. We find this in verse number 34, and once again in chapter number 33 in verse number one, where the Bible says in verse one, and the Lord said unto Moses, depart, and go up hence thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed, will I give it. I want you to consider God's plan for Israel. We think about God's plan for Israel. We understand that the first promise that God made considering having a people and giving them a land was made to Abraham all the way back in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. The Bible says in verse number 1 of Genesis 12, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy house unto a land. The promise was repeated to Abraham when he was 99 years old in Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 8 where he says, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. 
After Abraham was willing to offer his only son Isaac on an altar, God again appears to him and reiterates this promise in Genesis chapter number 22 and verse number 17, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Isaac was also given this same promise. We learn of this in Genesis 26, 3. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and to thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Jacob, too, was visited by God and given this promise in Genesis 28, verses 13 to 15. And hundreds of years had passed since the promise was first given. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have long been dead, and so have their children. But God had not forgotten his promise to his people. And he commands Moses, now is the time for them to finally enter the land that was promised to them all these centuries ago. And that's what's happening in the context of this passage. It's time now. Providentially, I have designed that now you guys go into the land. Rise up, depart, and go up hence. Move forward. Go possess the land that I've given you. Which leads me to consider not only God's plan for Israel, but let's consider God's plan for the church. We find in Matthew chapter number 28, verses 18 to 20, what we know is the Great Commission before Jesus ascended back to his heavenly throne, after giving his life and after rising from the dead and after his earthly ministry, he paused for just a moment on that hillside and he reminded his followers, here's why I'm leaving you. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, again, go forward, go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Can I share with you that implicit in these words, the Great Commission, are some key concepts. Number one, let me say this, the power of God is at our disposal as a church. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You say, well, how in the world are we possibly going to reach the world with the gospel? Well, we, we can't do it on our own. But when we remind ourselves that we are functioning and we are operating in the power that is given unto us, the power that is greater than all of heaven and all of earth, we're reminded that all power is given unto us to do the job that God has called us to do. We were reminded in this great commission, not only that the power of God is at our disposal, but that we are to go everywhere and preach Jesus. Did you know, did you know that you are, you are a preacher of the gospel? Every man, every woman, every teenager, every boy and girl in this place, if you know Jesus, you have the responsibility to go forward and teach and preach the gospel to lost people. Did you know that when once we've preached Jesus and they've accepted that we are given the responsibility to baptize them. You saw the numbers that appeared. And while I'm thankful for 65 that followed the Lord in believers' baptism, we can do better as a church. We ought to do better. We ought to raise the goal. We ought to raise the standard. And, and why is it that uh, more than 100 trusted Christ, uh, but, but, but not nearly as many follow the Lord in believers' baptism? We, we have failed in our responsibility. The, the, pe pe people don't have the responsibility to say, well, I'm saved, now, I, now what's my next step? I need to be baptized. No, listen, we have been given the responsibility as a church is to teach these people. We're to share the gospel with them, and then we are to teach them what the next step for them is. Notice, after they've been baptized, they're to be taught the scriptures, Bible, church, doctrine, from the word of God. And by the way, you, you heard within the men that spoke just a moment ago, you heard a systematic plan that we have. Uh, it begins with outreach, going out into the community, passing out gospel tracts, telling people about Jesus, and then bringing them into the church, seeing them follow the Lord and believer's baptism. And then from there, we transition them, whether it be on Sunday morning to the Bible doctrines class that Pastor Jack teaches, or whether it be on Wednesday night to the one-on-one -on -one discipleship that Brother Witzke oversees. But we see this pattern we have ever everything within our disposal to do what God has called us to do, to reach our community, to tell them about Jesus, to baptize them once they've understood and accepted Christ, and then to teach them all things whatsoever God has commanded them. 
And I want you to notice the last part of the Great Commission. He says, and lo, I am with you always. Now, I want to I paint this picture tonight because book ending the Great Commission are two things. The power of God and the presence of God. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. At the end, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I want you to know something. God's plan for his church is to do exactly what he commissioned us to do. But we cannot do it. We cannot do it in our own strength, in our own power, in our own ability. We can only do it through the power of God and with the presence of God. And as we consider this idea of moving forward, I want you to know that we must go forward, yes, but only as God leads us, only in his power and in his presence. Secondly, I want you to notice from this passage, not only the prompting, but notice secondly the promise of an angel in verses two to four. He says, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, verse three, and unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. We see, first of all, the responsibility of the angel is found in verses two and three. God says, I'm going to send this angel. He's going to go before you. And he is going to be responsible to drive out the inhabitants. He is going to give you power. He is going to give you the ability that you need so that you as just a small group of people can walk into a land that has giants, fortified cities, chariots of iron. This angel is going to go before you. And he is going to help you to drive out the inhabitants of the land. God promised an angel. In the fulfillment of this promise that they had longed for and waited for hundreds of years, God says, I'm still going to give you the land. And the responsibility of the angel is going to help you to go into the land and to possess it. This heavenly being that God would send would be powerful enough to do what God intended be done. But I want you to notice, secondly, the, res the reason for the angel is found in verse number 3. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people. God told Moses that the angel would be necessary because he would not go before them. The reason he would not be involved was because of the stubbornness of his people. Over and over again, in the short time that they had been free from Egypt, they had complained and they had murmured about God and his leading them. They did so at the Red Sea in Exodus 14, verses 10 to 12. They did so in the wilderness of sin in Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3. They did it at a place called Rephidim in Exodus 17, 1 to 3. And finally, when Moses was too long in the mount, receiving the law of God, receiving the oracles of God, they fell into idolatry and they crafted a golden calf that they bowed down and they worshiped. And God finally said, enough. I'm removing my presence. From this people, I will still fulfill my promise because that's who I am. I always keep my word, but I will not go forward with you. Therefore, the angel was summoned. You will lead the people into the promised land. And you'll get all that I told you you were going to get. But there's one thing that's going to be lacking, and that's my presence. I want you to notice... Thirdly, the resistance to this angel. We find in verse number four, and when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments or his clothing. We find in verse number 15 that Moses said this to God, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Both the people and their leader, Moses, resisted, resisted the thought of entering the promised land minus the presence of God. I pray that I'm not the only one in this congregation who feels the way that I do. What I'm saying is this. Am I, am, am I, am I excited and, 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 and thrilled that, that I might have an opportunity to make an impact in some lives without question? 
Do I believe God has called me to do what God has called me to do? Absolutely. I want you to know something. I will, I will walk away if God doesn't go forward with us. And I would think that every last one of us would say, we want to go forward into the future, but not in our own strength, in our own power, not even in some semblance of the power of God, but we want the full presence of God that rests upon us. You see, they recognized that they longed for much more than just an angel to do what God had called them to do. They weren't just satisfied with, with, with just a semblance of God's power and his presence. They wanted the real thing. And I'm calling our church to seek the same. I'm calling us to say, no more are we going to do ministry in our own strength, in our own power. No more are we going to try to reach the community of Cleveland, Ohio in our own strength, in our own power. But we must fully rely upon God, upon his power and upon his presence. Thirdly, tonight, let's consider the priority of his presence found in verses 12 to 16. Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. We find here in verses 12 and 13, in verse number 15, we find the request for God's presence. You see, Moses was not content with just the promise of an angel to go before them. He asked God to identify this angel in verse number 12. Who is this angel? You've not told me this angel. What is his name? Uh, who is he? What does he look like? Ultimately, in verse 13, Moses says, God, we've got to have more than just an angel to lead us. He says, we must have you. We must have your presence to go before us and to lead us. And Moses is so sincere in this request that he says this. He says, we would rather not go up at all than to go it alone without the presence of God. I want to ask this question. Are we satisfied with results? Or will we only be satisfied with God? Are we satisfied with just rules and standards or do we long for so much more than this? Do we long for relationship? Do we long for his presence? You see, God told them the angel would be sufficient to get the job done. But his desire was more than just to inhabit the land. Moses said, I don't want, we don't just want the land. We want you. He wanted to know that the person and the presence of God would also be with them. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul who said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And I'm afraid, listen, I'm afraid we have substituted. We have substituted things that we do as a substitute for the presence and power of God in our lives. We have substituted the fact that we go to church three times a week, believing that that somehow gives us special favor with God. We have substituted the fact that we may be dressed in a certain way or that we have a certain type of music that we, uh, that we believe honors God, and we think that gives us what we need. That gives us his power and that gives us his presence. We, we believe that we have the, the right Bible, and that, we, that we, we don't have a, a version that is, that is tainted or that is missing Scripture. And so because I have that, because I'm only reading out of the King James Version, I'm getting all of my teaching out of the King James Version. Well, then I'm fine. I want you to know something. You and I need so much more than just the fact that we wear a nice suit of clothes. We need so much more than just the fact that we go to church three times a week. We don't see so much more than just the fact that we might listen to the right music or that we might uh, d d choose not to go after entertainment choices that are wicked and that are ungodly. Listen to me. Listen to me. These things have become substitutes. They become substitutes. And we, listen, we have raised a generation who have come to church three times a week and they've dressed the right way. And they've carried the right Bible. And they've sat under right preaching. But they don't know our God. They've never encountered Him. And as a result, they reach a certain age and they walk out the door and they never return. And I'm here to tell you 
that I want so much more than that. I want to know him. I want to experience him. And I want to go forward, but only, only if he's going to go with us. No longer, no longer are we going to substitute anything for his power and for his presence. The request for his presence, notice secondly, the guarantee of his presence, verse 14. God says this, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. I want you to know something. If you want to know God tonight, you can know God. If you want to experience God tonight, you can experience God. If you want your family and you want your children to experience God, I want you to know something. You can have that. Because God still says, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. God still says, if you want it, you can have it. And Moses said, God, not just an angel. God, give us your presence. And God says, you want that? I will go with you. Oh, I will lead the way. I will go into the promised land with you. I will do more than just send an angel. I will go in the midst of you. I will lead you if you really want it. The guarantee of his presence. Some have asked me, well, are you nervous? The answer is yes. Of course. I've never done this before. You know me. That makes me even more nervous. <laughs> Many of you, you remember me from days gone by. Are you nervous? Are you fearful? Are you anxious? I suppose all of those words could be used to describe my feelings from time to time. Well, I want you to know something. God will lead us. If we truly seek it, if we desire it, Listen, I don't, I don't have to lead you. I just have to be following Christ. And if I'll follow Christ, then God will give me everything that I need. And God will give my family everything that they need. And God will give this church everything that it needs. So we simply follow forward. Finally, lastly, we consider the impact of His presence. Notice what Moses says in verse number 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Why is his presence so important in our lives? Because, because listen, God's people are unique not because of their own power. I'm just like everybody else. I'm not unique because of my own talent and my own ability. I'm not unique because of my strength. This church isn't unique because it's a larger church. There's a lot larger churches in our world today, even in this city. That, does, that doesn't make us unique. We're not unique because we have a 60-year history. There's churches way older than us. We're not, we're not unique because we dress a certain way and because we carry a certain Bible and because we preach a certain message. That doesn't make us unique. You can always find someone who does what we do. You can even find some who take it a step further than even we take it. They're out there in this world today. You want to know what makes us unique? Holy Spirit power in our lives. His presence in our lives. That makes us different. And if you and I, if we're going to be different, it's not going to be in our own power. The fact that we're strong in numbers, that we have a tactical plan or a strategic plan, it's not going to be in our weapons of warfare. What will make us unique and different from the rest of the world is going to be the fact that the presence of God dwells in our lives. Is it possible to attend the right church and still be like the world? You better believe it. Is it possible to wear the right clothes and still be like the world? No question about it. Is it possible to carry the right Bible, listen to the right music, say the right words, and still be like the world? Listen, Christian living, the life, living the Christian life doesn't make you and me different. It doesn't. It doesn't. Here's what makes us different, knowing God. Knowing God. Listen, 
The world talks about God. The world talks about the Bible. The world's familiar with this book. The world knows about church. Many people in the world go to church. Is our world improving? No. Because there's just not that many people who are sincerely seeking the presence and the power of God in their lives. Listen, I'm calling us to go forward as a church, but only if he's going to lead us there. And I'm also here tonight to say that if he decides to withdraw his presence, his power, and his blessing from us, then we, listen, we might as well close the doors. We might as well sell everything that we have and go our separate ways and never return to this place ever again. Because listen, if God is not in our presence, we are no different than the rest of the world. So what I'm saying is we want to go forward, yes. But we're not going to go forward by following me. Just like we haven't gone forward by following Pastor Folger for the last 23 and a half years. If we've gone forward at all, it's because God has led us. And if we're going to go forward in the future, it's because God will lead us.